So what does hard jump algorithm do? So let's do some definition first. Um, so I'm sure all of you know what a directed graph is. OK, that's fine. Let's talk about what a strongly connected component is. Right. So in normal undirected graph, a connected component is just a bunch of vertices that are um, connected together by edges, right? So that's pretty simple. A strongly connected component is an analog of that for directed graphs. So there's this concept of weakly and strongly connected components. Let's talk about this. So I'm going to draw a graph below. Right. Let's just say this graph has eight vertices, and we'll just draw them like this. I'm just going to draw some edges on this graph. Oh, sorry about that. Let's draw like a cycle here. So this is okay. We can have two edges between a pair of you nodes know, as long as they're going in different directions, right? Right. So this graph is what's called weakly connected. Right. This entire graph is weakly connected, meaning that um, if these edges, if you replaced all these directed edges with their undirected counterparts, then the entire graph would be a single connected graph. Right. So that's all weakly connected means. It's a pretty simple concept. Strongly connected is a little stronger than that. Um, so what strongly connected means is that for any pair uv of nodes in the component, there exists a path from u to v, and there exists a path from v to u, right? Meaning that we can get from any vertex of the component to any other vertex of the component by following a directed path. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's do an example for this graph. So this right here, these four nodes are a strongly connected component. The reason why is from any node, let's say this node, I can get to this node to this node. I can also get to this node, right? So from this node, I can get to any other node. Also from this node, I can get to any other node, right? In particular, we actually have this like cycle going on here. And by using these edges, since this graph is like connected in kind of like a cycle fashion, we can get from any node to any other node. Does everyone see why this is the case? Um, if you don't, then now is the time to seek out. Great. So. Um, right, so that's one strongly connected component. Can, does anyone think they can point out another strongly connected component in this graph? Right, so this will be a maximum subset of nodes so that for any pair inside this subset, this subgraph, there exist paths from one node to the other in both directions. Two right mouse nodes. Thanks, Freddy. So this is a strongly connected component. It's actually a cycle, and a general cycle of our also are always trying to take components, right? Because it's cycle, you get from any node to any other by just looping around the cycle until you got to the other one, right? So this is a two cycle. It's another strong component. Sorry. Um, cool. Are there any other strongly connected components? Okay, so I have a suggestion from James. James, um, so the suggestion is that the middle four components are only connected. Right, so we pointed out, why aren't the middle four components strongly connected, right? The reason why the middle four components aren't strongly connected is, like, let's say you have these two nodes, this U and this is V, right? There does exist a path going from U to V, but there doesn't exist a path going from to U. Right. Remember that we can only traverse these edges along their direction. So if we want to get from V to U, then like we can go down here, go to the right, and we can go like here. But there's no way to actually get back to U. Right. So this is not a strongly connected component. Good try. 
This is a good counterexample. This is an SEC, this is an SEC. Does anyone see any other specific components? Right. So each of these two remaining nodes is also in a strongly connected component of size one by itself. Right. And the reason why they're of size one is there's no way to get from this node back to itself along the path. Right. There's just no cycle that contains that node. Uh, okay. So in particular, this means that, for example, um, if this node, if this node were in a strongly connected component of five greater than one, then if it was you and you had another v over here, then there would exist a path from u to v and then a path back from v to u. So therefore, there must be a cycle passing through u, right? So therefore, if we have a node that has no cycles passing through it, then it has to be an specific component by itself. That makes sense. Yeah. So these two nodes are both in their own strongly connected components, right? So as you can see, we've decomposed this graph of 5H into four strongly connected components. 4 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2, right, equals 8. In general, strongly connected components are decomposed graphs, meaning that every vertex is in exactly one strongly connected component, right? It's like a partition of the vertices into a component, just like for undirected graphs. Right now, does everyone understand like this is a strongly connected component? This definition. Are there any questions about this? All right. Um, great. So that's the first definition we need. The second definition is going to be the condensation. Um, so this is just a. Um, this immediately follows strongly connected components, so like a corollary. So the condensation is a directed acyclic graph, or I guess, yeah, we'll just call it a directed acyclic graph with one vertex for every strongly connected component. Um, so I guess we should say made by collapsing strongly connecting components. OK. In particular, I did, this is best shown with an example. So I'm just going to draw that. This entire graph down here, I know it's a little messy, I'm sorry, condenses into the following graph. Sorry. Oh, oops, that's my bad. Um, before we draw that last node. And condense it into the following graph. So what this is saying is that each of these nodes in the condensation graph corresponds to one of the strongly connected components in the original graph. And then each of the edges corresponds to an edge between strongly connected components. Oh, sorry, I think this is slightly incorrect. I'm missing this edge right here, which corresponds to this edge in the condensation. That's my bad. Uh, I might have drawn this a little too small. Right? Um, so does everyone understand how we got from like this giant graph, the original graph, it's just a general directed graph, into this condensation? Uh, each of these strongly connected components, you can imagine them like shrinking down to a single node, one of these rev nodes in the condensation, and the edges go between the new node for the strongly connected components. Right. Um, so I have a question for you. Why must the condensation be an acyclic graph? Right. 
I just told you in the definition that the condensation of a directed acyclic graph. But why acyclic? Why can't there be any cycles in the condensation? Right. The reason why is because if you had a cycle in a condensation, that would reflect a cycle between strongly connected components, right? That would mean that you could get from strongly connected component one to two to three and back to one or something like that, right? But if you could go between these strongly connected components in the following way, then that means that these strongly connected components would just form a larger strongly connected component, right? And that would be a contradiction because strongly connected components are assumed to be maximal, right? So this is why the condensation of a graph is always acyclic. And this property turns out to be really useful for solving problems in graph theory. All right, so with that out of the way, we have our definitions done. Um, now we're going to introduce charge and algorithm, which is a way to actually compute the strongly connected components and the condensation of a graph in linear time, right? linear in the vertices and edges. So let's talk about the algorithm. Here's how Tarjan algorithm works. It's kind of like a variant of the um, topological sorting algorithm, if you've ever heard of that. Um, it's fine if you haven't. So the way it works is what we're going to do is just start an arbitrary node. Right. Just start at this node right here. We're going to maintain two arrays throughout this algorithm. We're going to maintain um, in array which is going to equal the time at which we reach a node. And we're also going to maintain a low array. And that's going to reflect, um, well, we'll see, but this is going to be like the low and low linking. This is going to refer to the minimal time um, for a path starting at that node. And we'll see what this means later, later on. Um, cool. So at the beginning, we've just like, we start at some arbitrary node, right? And we're going to give this node time zero, since it's our first node. And we're also going to initialize the low value to zero, because, well, we haven't visited any other nodes yet, so. Just zero, zero, All right? And now we do some DFS starting at this node, right? So we go down and we might reach another node right here, right? So now that we're at this node, we're going to get time one. So the time increments by one every time we reach a new node. And you're also going to initialize this low value to one, right? So, so far, so good. <laughs> I mean, pretty, right now it's pretty simple. Um, this continues onward. So we keep going down. Say this node, we reach an entirely new node again. And let's give this time two. And we also initialize the low value to two. Right. And we keep finding new nodes. So we go down again. And now we get a node with time three and low value three. So this continues for some time. All we're doing right now is the DFS. So, I, so I'm just running a DFS on this graph, keeping track of which node I visited. All right, uh, let's do this one more time to visit a new node. So you see we're, we're kind of building a tree structure here. Um, and indeed, if the graph was acyclic, then we would actually be building like a tree structure like this. We would never revisit a a previously visited node. But alas, this graph is not acyclic. And from this node, we DFS downward, and we go back to this node. Right? So let's say we go back to node two. We found this edge that points back upward. What do we do? Right? So whenever we find an edge that points upward, we don't continue our DFS from 
node two because that node we already pivoted, right? If we don't need to revisit that node, that would create an infinite loop. Um, sorry, I'm trying to draw a dotted line here. So this is an edge going from node four to node two, right? So whenever we have an edge that goes, a directed edge that goes from a node with higher time to a node with lower time, right? A node that, um, our current node to a node that we already visited, then what we do is we set low of this current node to equal the minimum of uh, that value with the time of the node at point two. So we set the low of this node from four to two. Okay. All this is saying is that um, from this node, we can follow some path and get to a node with time two. And that's the minimum time we can reach by going down a path in this node. All right. And that's it. Cool. So from then on, um, that's fine. Now let's say that this has one more child. Um, let's say this points back to node three as well. Um, so now that we see this other edge that points back from node four to node three, we want to update the low value to three. However, three is not smaller than two, right? We can actually get higher back inside this path by going back to node two rather than following this edge. So we actually just keep the low value at two. This edge doesn't really matter. All right, cool. So let's say we're done DFSing at this node. Okay, node is done. All right. So now this node returns, and now the DFF goes back to parent, right? And now when the parent, um, when the parent finishes calling DFF on a child, it takes its low value and takes the minimum of that low value and the low value of its child. So since from this child you can get to node two, from this parent its low value also gets updated to two. Right? And all this is saying is from this parent there exists a path that goes to a node with time two, and that's the minimum time you can reach. All right, let's say this node have another child here. So now we've found a new node, so we increment the time to five, and the default will have low value five. Right. All right, so now let's say that this node has no other edges coming from it. So I've done the DFF return from here. So now in this case, we want, to, we want to see from this parent, we want to update its low value if there exists a path down to this child and back upward. Unfortunately, there doesn't, right? If we don't have to update the low value for the parent. However, notice that when the parent returned, its low value is equal to its in value. So whenever something's low value is equal to its in value, what we do is we start a new following connected component from this vertex, right? So this vertex is like, quote unquote, the root of the following connected component. Root in, in a vague sense, referring to like this tree structure. So following connected components don't actually have roots, but this is the root in our DFF tree, right? So this is our first following connected component. Turn this first. Great. So that's a pretty trivial function component, right? It's just a single node. Now let's keep going. And suppose now that this node right here have no more, um, no more edge coming from it, so this returns, right? So now we go back to this node. So we take the low of this node and take the minimum of that low and the low of its child. However, right now they're equal. So we don't actually have to update that. So this one has one more child that goes down here. So now that we have this child, what's the first thing we do? Uh, I, I think we've already been through six nubs, so I'm trying to um, get some input from y'all. So what's the first thing we do when we visit a child, if we follow this pattern?
set up in and load to six. Great. So we increment the current time to six, and we set up in and load to six. Right. Thanks, James. All right. So now let's say this child has an edge, and let's say that edge points to node five. What do we do now? So this is a node that's already been visited, right? Um, so then should we update the low value to five? Because there exists a path going from node to a node with time five, right? So actually it turns out that we don't do this. Um, and the reason why is because if this node was itself, like if this was the only edge going from this node, then it will be in its own trolling connected component, right? However, if we update the low value when there's an edge pointing to like a node that was already popped off the stack, a node whose trolling signal was already found, then in of this node would not equal the low of this node. So our algorithm wouldn't actually like meet the necessary criteria to start a new component, right? So because of this, we do not update the low value if we have an edge pointing to a node that's already popped off the stack that's already found in front of components, right? So this remains six, actually. It's a little tricky case of target and algorithm. So let's say that's the only edge going from this node. OK. Oh, sorry. Uh, so then let's say that we actually have No, it's fine. We'll just let it be a phone strong instruction component. Let's say that's the only edge. Right, so now we pop off. We see that in and low are the same value. And then we pop off the second strong instruction component. After this returns. Uh, sorry, let me try to explain that again. So the reason why it doesn't get it updated to 5 is because if it got updated to 5, this 5 is useless. Um, the reason why it's useless is that this five refers to a node that's already been popped off the stack. It's been like an entirely strong component from what we're currently considering, right? But we only, in general, we want the low values to actually point to like nodes that are like ancestors of the current one. This node is not an ancestor of the current one at all. It's just in like some random position on another subgen and different strong components. That's why we, um, so that's why if like a node have already gotten popped off the stack, this we do we don't update. Um, the value. Yeah, no problem. All right, so, sorry, let's track of where I was. Yes, so this is six. So in and low are the same for this node, and then we make a new strong exchange component. Okay, so for that returns, and we go to this node, this node returns two, low two, no two of returns, right? Now notice that node to have in and low value is the same thing. So it becomes the root of a new file stack component. And we pop off from the stack all of the nodes that we visited and try our DFF until we get to node two. So that's all of these nodes down here. Ah, sorry. It's a bit of drawing. There we go. That's pretty clean. All right. And this is our third following connection component. All right. That's it. So now we reset and we're back to node one. So node one updates its low value to the min of one and two, which is just one, so nothing changes. And now let's say that node one has one child down here. Let's see, we're running out of space a little. Let's say child's actually over here. Great. So now we visit a new node. We update the low value, oh, sorry, the, the time. So that the in value and set the low value to the same value. Sorry. Seven. Right. All right. Um, now I'm going to give you a little bit of a puzzle. Let's say that this guy has two children. So, I mean, I've already prevented like the um, main idea of the algorithm. Let's see if. Let's say we have an edge case here. Let's say that seven have two children, eight and nine.
And let's say these eight and nine both have edges pointing to each other. Right. So in this case, the new following checking limbs, eight and nine would be in their own following checking component, right? Because they're in a cycle. However, if we run the algorithm like this, then wouldn't it be true that since eight and nine both have their in value equal to their low value, shouldn't they each be in their own separately strongly connected component if we run the algorithm? So my question is like, what's going on here? What's the problem with this? Um, why is the algorithm breaking on this example? When we have like a pair of um, cross edges going on between these two nodes. Right, so I'm just trying to like illustrate like an example of like where this algorithm might fail. I'm trying to break this algorithm on a graph. So I'm asking you if I gave you this graph and I ran the algorithm on it, starting from node seven, and I got to node eight and nine, right? And eight and nine are both pointing to each other. Why wouldn't this algorithm be wrong? And don't worry, this is a pretty, um, yeah. Wow, I'm surprised. Okay, I'm gonna say that this is like a pretty subtle, um, like the, the, the reason why this doesn't work is pretty subtle, but no, you got it spot David. So the reason why is just this, this scenario just never happens. Like if A and 9 were pointing to each other, then since we're doing a DFF rather than a BFF or some other recursive search, then like, let's say we use node eight first, then nine would just be a child of node eight, right? It wouldn't be a child of node seven at all. This graph would actually look like this. Oops. Right, it wouldn't um, look like what I drew at all. So actually that algorithm works fine. Oh, oops. So actually the algorithm works fine. What happens is that our cycle from eight to nine just looks like this. And then the low of nine is set to eight. And then the low of eight equals the n of eight. So that creates a new strong executive component. So I'm trying to draw these boxes kind of clean. And this is our fourth strongly connected components, right? And both of these return. So that worked just fine. And now, again, node seven have an edge pointing down to node nine. But now this is just like an already visited dotted edge, right? And this dotted edge points into like something that's already been popped off the stack, a brown box, so we ignore it. And now node seven have nothing if n equals its low. So when it returns, it becomes its own strongly connected component as well. Our Sorry. Actually, just for a um, more interesting test case, let's say that seven also has a edge pointing back to node zero. Right, so now it's low value gets updated to zero. So now when node seven returns, node one gets its, in value, or its low value updated to zero because its child has low value zero. Then it returns and the root gets its low value unchanged. And when it returns, its low value equals its in value. So it finally creates the last strongly connected component. Right. And then we finished our DFF through the entire um, portion of this graph that's visible from node zero. Oops. Sorry. Cool. So this is SCC5. And we found five strongly connected components. Great. Um, so notice also that the strongly connected components are returned in some order. They're actually returned in reverse topological order. 
right? If you go from FCC one, two, three, four, five, you can see that they're you can verify they're actually in reverse topological order, which is pretty nice. This is another consequence of charging the algorithm because of the way we did the DFS. Right. So that's a pretty nifty side effect. Actually, if you run target algorithm on a corrected acyclic graph, then the entire low and in thing breaks down and you're just left with the topological sorting algorithm. So that's a nifty, um, it's like a reduction of target algorithm, essentially. All right, so any questions about that example of target algorithm? So that did take a while, but it is a pretty tricky algorithm. So yeah, feel free to ask any questions about this. I think this is also in one of your handouts. So um, if you don't want to ask a question now, then um, you can think about that on the handout as well. Great. So uh, let's write the code for target algorithm. Uh, sorry, that's not the right letter. So let's give you the pseudo code really quick. Um, it's a little tricky at first, so I'm giving this to you. All right, so this is going to involve two functions, a DFS function and then like the main function, right? So this is going to be our DFS procedure. Um, node n, all right. So I'm going to initialize two global arrays. Um, we're going to initialize the inner array, which I believe I colored blue. Yes, blue. So the inner array is going to equal like all negative ones. And I'm also going to initialize the low array to all negative ones as well. Though it actually doesn't really matter what I initialize this to. Um, Right, so this is going to be our two global arrays. Uh, I say those are going to be our two global arrays, but there are actually a couple more. Um, I was, I'm, we're also going to keep a stack. Um, and that's going to start out with nothing in it. So this is going to be our stack of no free vivid inside the DFS. And we're also going to keep an in stack array, which is just going to be a bunch of booleans. And there's initialized to all false. All right, so this will be true if uh, the node is currently in our stack array. So it can be a faster way of checking if something is stack. This is actually pretty necessary. I've actually seen some online implementation of a target algorithm that don't use in stack, and they run an on squared time. So clearly that person never tested their code. Um, and this was in a production project, which is pretty embarrassing. But anyway, um, so let me give some more space for this procedure now. DFS and so let's see. So what does this look like? Um, first of all, we're going to initialize low and in to equal a new new variable t, um, and we're going to increment this time. Right, and let's say that time is just a global variable that starts at like zero or something. It doesn't really matter. All right, so we just increment this to a new value. We're all going to push the node onto the stack. Right, when we first visit it, or we're going to set in stack of n to be true. All right. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over all of the adjacent nodes. So for Z adjacent to N, so for all V such that there's an edge from N to V directly, if um, in V, so if V have not been visited yet, is equal to negative one, right? Then we're going to call the FF from V. 
And then we're going to set low n to equal the minimum of low n and low v. Okay, this is like the low update we did before for the children. Otherwise, if we have a dotted edge, and it's also an edge that goes to a node that haven't already been part of the stack. So else if V is on the stack, then we set low of N to equal in of low of N and in of V. You can also replace this with V of low, but in of V is just more correct in my opinion. Um, if I follow the original implementation in charge of paper, so yeah. Um, right. So that's like the main recursive part. Now, at the end of a of this program, before we return, um, I think I'm going to have to continue this little code on the next page. Sorry about that. Um, so at the end of this program, before we return. So we're going to have this clause here. If our current node has a low value equal to its in value, then we have to, then we, then this node is like the root of a new strong extra component, right? Uh, I say root, I mean, you know what I mean. Um, it's not technically a root, but if a root inside our DFS tree is what this means. So sorry, I should mention this is, a, this is an edge and this is a dotted edge. So this isn't if if we find a new root first on the component, then here's what we do. So um so repeat forever. Um we're going to let you be the top node in our stack and we're going to pop from it, right? And then we're going to set the, uh, the strong extra component that you have in to equal the current strong extra component. Um, and then we're also going to set in stack of view to be false if we pop it off of the stack. And then if, uh, so we keep popping nodes off our stack forever until we reach the current node that we're in. So if u is equal to the current node, the root of our strong check component, then we break out of this loop, right? And that way we don't loop forever. Once that's done, uh, if we found the new strong check component, and then we increment the number of strong check components we found so far. Should be consistent about my semicolon. Sorry about that. And then that fits. And then we can return. All right, so that finishes the DF function. Um, this is a pretty long algorithm. Usually I wouldn't write this out, but charging the algorithm is like notorious for being hard to implement and kind of confusing. So that's why I'm writing out higher code code and explaining it. Um, cool. So that's the DFF function. Um, we're not done yet though, because we can have like a graph that looks like this. Um, so let's say we have a graph that looks like this. Right. And let's say we initialize our DFF starting from this node. Right. But when we do our DFF, we only ever visit like these nodes over here. And indeed, we find that they're in a single strong stack on it inside our first DFS call, right? Um, so this is strong component one. However, this isn't actually good enough because like we haven't even, even looked at this other node yet, right? And this node has an entirely uh, different strong component. Like let's say, 
definition like a strong extra component like this. So we actually need, we can't just do a single DFF actually. We actually need to keep iterating over every single node in the graph. And every time we come across an unvisited node, we DFF from it, right? And that way we can actually get through all of the strong extra components, not just the ones visible, but from whatever node we pick. Um, right, so, so essentially this means that we have to, we are over all the nodes. And DFF, whenever we find an unvivid one, right? Um, so then, I mean, we can just write the serial code for this last part. Um, this is called Tarjan. graph and this is pretty simple. Um, so we initialize SCC and in of course and then like for each node n if we haven't visited n for well, if in value is equal to negative one then we DFF from n. And that's it. So this is the final um, wraparound. Yeah, so this is the final algorithm. Right, so, wow, that was a doozy. So, um, yeah, um, this is a kind of important algorithm. So I'm sure this is new to you who haven't heard of this algorithm before, um, but it's really important to know. Um, and it pops up a lot in graph theory problems, especially in the platinum and gold levels. So um, prove it here. I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious, but the time complexity of this algorithm is linear, O n plus m. Reason linear shows you literally just visit every node once, right? So because you never revisit a node if it's already visited. So it's literally just a DFS. Um, so it's time m n and memory m plus m. And you get all strong extension components. Uh, I should also, if you want to construct the condensation graph, what you do is what this algorithm gives you is like an array. So like for every strong extra component, sorry, for every node, it tells you which strong extra component that node is in, right? It gives you like an i of that um, node. Sorry, this is the output. Right, it tells you what strong extra component that node is in. Um, if you compute the condensation graph, all you have to do is iterate over every single edge inside the graph. And if that edge, let's say go from u to v, if u and v are different strong extra components, then you just add a new edge to the station. Right. So that's how you construct the condensation graph after doing target algorithm. Phew. All right, that was a lot. Um, any questions about anything in related to target algorithm?